Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to what I think is going to be a very unique and interesting presentation tonight. Uh, Who's Your Lifelines? Environmental and Social Change Along the Monon, 1847 until 2020. We've been doing online presentations at the center dating back over a year now uh, to April of 2020 when our, our world changed. And we've really enjoyed the additional engagement we've received from these online events, being able to connect more with you, uh, with more of you and share more unique work from even wider uh, parts of our community. And we look forward to continuing online programming in the future in addition to returning to the in-person events and conferences that we enjoy so much. In addition to these presentations and our conferences, the center also maintains an archive of ne nearly half a million railroad photographs, which continues to grow. We have several people in our archives team processing those so that we can share these images and make them available. We also publish our quarterly journal, Railroad Heritage, uh, one book a year right now. And we have several traveling exhibitions that go to museums and galleries all over the country. Uh, making those uh, traveling exhibits happen, as well as these online presentations, is our exhibitions and events coordinator, Haley Page, who's with us tonight. And Haley's going to have just a couple of housekeeping items about the Zoom platform we're now using. Yeah, um, yes, welcome everyone. As if you've joined us with um, other presentations, you'll know that you, um, as an audience, do not have access to your personal audio or video, but you should be receiving our audio um, and seeing the screen that Elizabeth is currently sharing. Um, I did get, see one note that someone's not getting any sound. Um, if you are, if you know that your computer is unmuted, I would go up to the Zoom icon in the top left corner, click on your um, services to system preferences and just check what your audio um, settings are in there to make sure that you are receiving all of the audio. Um, if there are any technical difficulties for whatever reason, you're not able to view the event properly, you're not able to get sound, um, what have you, we are recording today's event and it will be posted on our YouTube page probably early next week. Let me just drop that in the chat right now, the URL for that. That is the where you can see all of our past presentations. We have recordings of all of the presentations we've done over the last year um, on our YouTube page there. Um, so you can also, throughout the presentation, change your view in the top right corner. There's the icon that says view. When you click that, you can change it from standard view where all of the um, all of the videos, the present panelist videos are on the top, or you can change that. Um, to gallery where it's on the side, or you can choose where it's just the speaker. Um, and again, that's in the top right corner. Um, throughout the presentation, you can utilize the chat function. Um, please use that for comments or a chit chat between the attendees um, or the panelists. Just above the chat box, you can click on the icon, change it from panelists or panelists and attendees. Um, if you're doing comments, make sure that you're clicking attendees so everyone can see what your comments are. Um, and if you'd like to submit questions for at the for the end of the presentation, we'll be having a Q&A session. Um, please send those through the Q&A, which is also at the bottom. Um, and we will get to as many of those as we can after the program. And with that, I will send it back over to Scott to do introductions. All right, well, thanks, Haley. And yes, as, as Haley says, uh, certainly feel free to, to ping us or, or use the chat function uh, during the presentation and put all those questions for our panelists into the Q&A. That just makes it easier for us to find all your questions and make sure we ask our panelists those questions at the end of the presentation tonight. Uh, so tonight's presentation is Who's Your Lifelines? Environmental and Social Change Along the Monon from 1847 to 2020. Uh, it was put together by a team of four different people, uh, two of whom are gonna be sharing their work with us tonight, Elizabeth Browning and Richard Koenig. Uh, I just had the pleasure of meeting Elizabeth, uh, virtually at least, a few moments ago. Uh, Richard, I've had the pleasure of knowing for a few years now through various uh, engagements and work at the center. Um, Richard told us about this, this uh, exhibition and project as it was coming together 
And it just hits so many of the things we like to do at the center in terms of taking an expansive look at railroads and their impacts on society and the ways we can view them visually and how they're represented in different parts of our culture. And the, the Monon Railroad is a railroad that, that has a profound impact on Indiana and beyond and is, is a, a kind of a microcosm, I think, of so much of what railroads do and how they're viewed. And I think this, this uh, presentation tonight will show a lot of that. So we're really excited to be able to share this with you. It's a wonderful interdisciplinary look at how a railroad impacts our lives and cultures. And that's something we feel very strongly about sharing at the center. Our two presenters are Dr. Elizabeth Grinnan Browning and Richard Koenig. Uh, Dr. Browning is a US historian whose research examines how Americans have thought about and engaged with environmental issues and built narratives around these experiences, particularly through the lenses of environmental health and social justice in the 19th and 20th centuries. She joined Indiana University's Environmental Resilience Institute as the Midwestern Indiana Community History Fellow in 2018 after receiving her PhD in history from the University of California, Davis. Her research spans a broad range of environmental histories from the interconnected stories of urban renewal and Superfund remediation in East Chicago to Midwestern farmers' decision-making regarding resilience practices. In all of her projects, Dr. Browning works to build public discussion about climate change through engagement with public history. She's joined tonight by Richard Koenig, who is the Genevieve U. Gilmore Professor of Art at Kalamazoo College in Michigan. Born in 1960, Koenig studied photography and holds degrees from the Pratt Institute and Indiana University. In the summer of 2010, he began working on a long-term documentary project called Contemporary Views Along the First Transcontinental Railroad. And four articles resulted from that between 2014 and 2019. In addition, he published a memoir piece about growing up in Indiana in our journal, Railroad Heritage in 2017, as well as one about New Mexico's last act of semaphores in railroad history. He's currently working on an article on railroads around Traverse City, Michigan. So everyone out there, won't you please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome tonight to Elizabeth Browning and Richard Koenig. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Scott, for that introduction. And thank you, Haley, as well, just for the, the kind invitation to present uh, to the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. And thanks everyone for joining this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to learn about the Center's impressive mission and its extensive programming. And I, I share Scott's sentiment that um, this exhibition really um, overlaps so well with the Center's work. Um, so it's really exciting. And I'm looking forward to the discussion at the end here. Um, Right, so I, th I think the history of the railroad can help us better understand many aspects of our nation's history um, from the social, cultural, economic, and environmental angles, among many others. Um, and there's really just so much to learn from studying the many facets of the railroad's history and its social significance. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here with Richard, especially who's such an expert, um, and I think is really the person you're gonna wanna hear from <laughs> today. So I, I wanna pass it off to him as quickly as I can. Um, but I, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement um, and not just regarding Bloomington, Indiana, where I'm currently based and where this research began, but a land acknowledgement for all the areas within Indiana that the Monon line traversed. Um, so we wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington and the former Monon Railroad are built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Chippewa, Delaware, Kaskaskia, Kickapoo, Miami, Ottawa, Peoria, Piankasha, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Wyandotte people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. So this evening, um, to give you a sense of, of where I'm headed with this discussion, I'm, I'm going to discuss the Hoosier Lifelines exhibition um, and the importance of the passenger and freight service of the Monon Railroad in a moment. Um, but since I'm talking about the legacy of Indiana's railway and infrastructure more broadly, I wanted to begin, um, I'd like to begin with the opportunity to offer a few reflections about the American Jobs Plan, which is very much in the news right now um, and would devote over $2 trillion to our nation's infrastructure. So I think this is a very timely, uh, timely issue and it overlaps a lot with what this exhibition is all about. Um, so as I offer my reflections, 
I'm going to play a brief clip of drone footage that we captured for the exhibition between the Monon's terminus points. So we'll start at the south um, in New Albany, uh, near Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and New Albany was founded on the banks of the Ohio River in 1813. Um, and it's where the New Albany-Salem line, the origins of the Monon line, was organized in 1847. We will then travel north through Lafayette along the Wabash River, where the Monon had a large shops yard where locomotives were serviced. Then we'll travel the Monon lines about 30 miles north through the small agricultural town of Monon, uh, which was platted by James Brooks, the first president of the Monon Railroad. Um, and it was platted in 1853 um, and had two train yards for the rail line there. The town now has a population of less than 2,000 people, and the only trains that run through are a CSX transportation line from Maynard, Indiana to Lafayette, and another line of CX, CSX uh, going north to Michigan City. Finally, the northernmost point will end is at Michigan City along the sand dunes of Lake Michigan. Um, and Michigan City was platted in 1833 with an eye toward its harbor serving as a favorable commercial location. And the town was selected as an endpoint for the Michigan Road, which ran through Madison, Indiana. Alongside the National Road, the Michigan Road was a major catalyst for settlement and economic growth in the region. So there's a lot of infrastructure in this footage here, and I thought it would be the perfect backdrop um, for my puzzling over how we as a nation um, define infrastructure. So I'm going to get this running here. Um, and I apologize if it's choppy on your end. I can't figure out how to make Zoom more, <laughs> more seamless here, but this footage is in our exhibition um, um, and it really adds a lot of vibrancy and life uh, to the space. So throughout my discussion of infrastructure, I wanna emphasize that I'm approaching this issue from two critical angles the importance of reducing carbon emissions, um, and secondly, rebuilding with racial equity at front and center. So these two focuses are, my, are central to my research perspective at Indiana University's Environmental Resilience Institute. Um, and the Institute has a commitment to implementation scholarship or research that informs the various public dilemmas that our communities um, currently face. In early March, 2021, the American Society for Civil Engineers graded US infrastructure at a C minus. And in 2019, the World Economic Forum ranked the US 13th in the world for overall infrastructure. So there's much improvement that needs to be done, as we all know. And I strongly suggest as a historian that policymakers look to our nation's history as an important guide for charting how to move forward. American history has shown time and again that infrastructure is, is integral to defining political belonging, and it's always shaped tensions between private capital and public welfare. As you've all heard by now, um, Biden's plan calls for spending and tax credits devoted to rebuilding 20,000 miles of roads, repairing bridges, eliminating lead pipes, building a clean, a clean electric grid, amplifying internet access, and providing affordable housing, schools, and workforce innovations. So this is a signal moment for the climate movement and a once in a generation opportunity to shift our national infrastructure towards a more resilient and just ends. The plan would move the nation to cleaner energy sources and it recognizes both the devastating impact that climate change has had on our nation's infrastructure and how our systems of infrastructure have contributed to carbon emissions. And I'm just going to pause here to um, uh, finish this drone footage. So we're headed north here from Monon, uh, I believe, to Michigan City is the next stop here. So um, part of what we wanted to capture, here's the uh, museum in Monon devoted to the railroad. But part of what we wanted to capture was how landscapes have changed since the beginning of the Monon, um, and especially humans' anthropogenic impact on, on the climate. So um, here in Michigan City, we have a NIPSCO plant, which is really a striking presence there. And Richard covered the northern 
portion of the rail line. So he has some wonderful contemporary photography um, that he'll share with you from this area. And here to the next slide. So in la the last year alone, in 2020, the United States faced 22 extreme weather and climate-related disaster events with losses exceeding $1 billion each, a cumulative price tag of nearly $100 billion. Chronic underinvestment and resilience has harmed American transportation infrastructure, disrupting service, making travel conditions unsafe, causing severe damage, and increasing maintenance and operating costs. So moving forward, I think we also need to pay heed to building racial equity within our systems of infrastructure and addressing injustices and in how these systems were designed and how they've operated. So you can see here the construction of Interstate 65 and 70 in Indianapolis. And these pass through areas that have been redlined, which is a discriminatory practice that began in 1933 with the formation of the Homeowners Loan Corporation which deployed this color-coded scheme to designate risk for mortgage lending. Neighborhoods shaded in red were deemed hazardous and people living there were ineligible for government-backed home mortgages, for home mortgage loans. On this map, you get a sense of where people were displaced and homes and businesses were demolished. And these were primarily lower income and black neighborhoods. Um, and you can see that 17,000 residents were displaced during the construction of these interstates um, and the demolition of 8,000 buildings in Indianapolis. The American Jobs Plan includes $20 billion for a new program that will reconnect neighborhoods cut off by historic investments and ensure, uh, pardon me, by um, the creation of the interstates and ensure new projects that will advance racial equity. So looking at these funding proposals, I wanna zero in on transportation, the majority of which is focused on our roads and providing incentives for electric vehicles. But there's also $85 billion for existing public transit and $80 billion for railways. And of course, as we're hearing in the news, this is um, going back and forth right now between Republicans and Democrats. So we'll see uh, what happens with these numbers. Um, but. This would be the biggest investment in rail travel in more than a generation, and it has the potential to bring public commitment to rail transportation back in line with the levels of investment that road and air travel have received over the past decades. The New York Times recently reported on these investment disparities and how they have helped contribute to a dominant car culture in the United States. Over the past 65 years, the U.S. has spent nearly $10 trillion in public funds on highways and roads, and just a quarter of that amount on subways, buses, and passenger rail. Since the early 1980s, Congress's transportation bills, which amount to multi-billion dollar investments every few years, um, and the vast majority of these investments have gone to highways and roads, about four-fifths all told. So this makes sense on paper as about 80% of Americans' trips are by car or light truck, compared to just 3% of mass transit. But the historical patterns of government commitment to roads and highways, which largely began with the creation of the interstate highway system in 1956, have much to do with why our cities and suburbs are sprawling environments that require a car to get around. And this is partly the reason why transportation is the sector most responsible for greenhouse gas emissions around 30% of America's greenhouse gas emissions to be exact, and much of which is from the country's hundreds of millions of gasoline burning cars and SUVs. Um, and I'll note that the more recent um, graph from the EPA's 2019 report has transportation at 29% of greenhouse gas emissions, but very, still very high. As I'm sure you all know, Amtrak, which is the largest passenger rail provider in the United States, has said that it will plan to expand service and upgrade existing tracks with as many as 30 new routes, and it will aim to expand ridership from 32 million to 52 million by 2035, which would amount to an important decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. And we know the Northeast Corridor you know, is heavily traveled by Amtrak passengers. Um, and it sees a steady ridership between Washington DC and Boston, but other major urban centers just don't have adequate access to inner city rails. 
For example, if you were to travel from Cincinnati to Chicago by rail, there's only one train that runs per day and the train departs at 1.40 a.m. in the morning and it, the trip takes nine hours. So it's not the most convenient form of transit. Uh, here in Indiana in June 2019, Amtrak canceled the Hoosier state line between Indianapolis and Chicago after the Indiana General Assembly voted not to approve the $3 million a year needed to keep the train going. This left the only Amtrak option between central Indiana and Chicago as the Cardinal, which operates between Indianapolis and Chicago three days a week. Amtrak projects that with Biden's funding plans, connections for Indianapolis um, would include increased service to Chicago and new routes to Cincinnati and Louisville. Although you can see here, there's a bit of a missed opportunity um, with a lack of a route between Indianapolis and Nashville. Amtrak's vision for future rail service includes a commitment to cleaner air, less traffic and better public health. Traveling by rail is up to 83% more energy efficient than driving and up to 73% more energy efficient than flying. And I will be getting to the Monon shortly. I see your comments there. Um, but I just want to situate us in the context of where rail is in Indiana um, and nationwide. Um, so when it comes to freight, railways are critical to Indiana's economic operations. In 2019, Indiana's manufacturing industry accounted for 27.4% of state GDP. And this is 2.7 times higher than the US average, and it's the highest of any state. Um, and I just have a few slides here from the Indiana Department of Transportation, which is currently updating the state rail plan. Federal law requires an update of this every four years. So um, it's nice to have these statistics at hand. Freight rail accounts for 13% of freight tonnage in Indiana with key industries relying on rail to be competitive, including automotive, chemicals, metals, grain and mining, uh, both coal and limestone. And you can see that trucking is the overwhelming favorite for transporting freight in the state, um, but there's a real opportunity for, um, for the railway to take on more freight here in the state. Um, and here's a look at where Indiana ranks in terms of how much it relies on rail today. Um, you can see Indiana's fourth in the number of freight railroads, 11th in total of rail line mileage, um, and it goes on and on. And I think it's just um, this data really underscores how critical the railway is in Indiana. Okay, so without further ado, I'll get to the Monon and the Hoosier Lifelines exhibition. So now that we have the lay of the land when it comes to our contemporary reliance on rail and its importance in our current debates about infrastructure, I wanna introduce the Hoosier Lifelines exhibition. The exhibit began as a discussion with myself, um, Maria Whiteman, who is the Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute Artistic and Social Practice Fellow, Betsy Sturrett, who is the Indiana University Grunewald Gallery of Art Director, Eric Sandweiss, who is a fellow historian. He's the Thomas and Catherine Miller Professor of History at IU Bloomington, and Richard Koenig joining us today and who you've um, heard about, who is the Genevieve U. Gilmore Professor of Art at Kalamazoo College. Um, and again, it's just a real honor to present with Richard. He has a deep knowledge about the railroad and a beautiful portfolio of work. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from him here soon. So the exhibit, uses the Monon's old right-of-way as a means of building a new understanding of the interplay of local landscapes, ecosystems, and social communities across time and space. We as historians, artists, and curators were interested in bringing the history of the Anthropocene as conveyed through the history of the railroad to the people of Indiana. And the Anthropocene quickly defined is the proposed geological epoch dating back to the beginning of significant human impact on Earth's ecosystems and geology, including anthropogenic climate change. The Hoosier Lifelines exhibit has two deeply interconnected parts. So first, the historical context that considers the Monon's underlying environmental, economic, and political contours. And second, photography documenting the places that the Monon reached, looking for new ways for us to connect, make community, and resituate our relationship with natural resources. Um, and just a quick uh, plug for if, if you can make it to New Albany, uh, the exhibit will be opening there on August 6th and um, it runs through October 16th. Um, so I'll, I'll drop that link in the chat after I present here. Um, and 
the exhibit was in Bloomington at the Grunewald Gallery of Art, um, and there is a virtual tour, which I really recommend. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so I'll also drop that link here in a moment. So when we look at the current state of rail in Indiana and the United States, it's kind of hard to believe how extensive this passenger and freight traffic of the state's railroad were in its heyday. Although I think all your members are not surprised by this. You're, you're deeply familiar with this, but to the you know, uh, to the novice of railroad history, it's, it's pretty amazing to look at these maps. Uh, so this map of the Monon Railroad from 1904 shows just how extensive the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville line was, which is what it was called at the time, with over 100 stops and over 600 miles of rail entirely within Indiana. And Richard, again, is going to talk more about the history, so I'll try and keep my notes brief. Um, but I do want to show you know, a few of my favorite maps. This is a really clean map that gives you a sense of where the Monon was. Um, and this is from the Monon's annual reports. Um, this is another one that I love. Um, it shows, you know, all the connecting lines um, that the Monon intersected with. So it was really striking, you know, the Monon is entirely within Indiana, but all of its marketing was about how the Monon connected Hoosiers to other places. Um, so that I saw that as a theme throughout um, uh, throughout its marketing. Uh, one of our goals um, in the exhibit was to compare, you know, these historic images. So we have New Albany here, um, a lithograph from 1897, and, and looking at you know what that landscape looks like today. So that was a fun um, part of this project. We also have Michigan City here, so we saw those as our um, kind of the book ends to the exhibit. Um, here's another example of some of the marketing, the Pullman Palace car route to Florida, again, how Indiana is connected to uh, many other places. Um, this is from the 1955 Monon Annual Report. Um, and the title for the exhibit came from this marketing of the lifeline of Indiana. So the Monon's history is a story of economic development and technological progress. There's no doubt about that. And this story is what we see retold in museums across Indiana. And there's a great deal of pride about that. And we, um, we really respect and honor that tradition. Um, and these are really important stories to tell. But these popular narratives about the railroad in Indiana do leave out that this economic and technological progress and our historical success came at a steep price, which was environmental degradation. And the railroad crystallizes for us the ways that we've depleted finite resources that we depend on for our way of life, and, the process, and in the process, how we've altered in unprecedented ways the planet that we live on. The railroad's been critical to shaping how the landscape has been envisioned, especially within the context of industrial capitalism. And it was striking in the course of the planning of planning the exhibit to think about how the railway was in itself this arbitrary line drawn on the landscape, and then it becomes this vector of connectivity. It's a cultural touchstone and an economic linkage. And this simple line becomes remarkably significant and has great consequences for social development and cultural prominence. So these are some of the questions that uh, you know, we were working with in the exhibit. Um, you know, the railway shows us where we've come from and how we might adapt moving forward um, now that the world that we've come to take for granted is no longer a certainty. Um, and I'll note again that it was really poignant to work on this exhibit this past year when COVID presented such an abrupt and deep rupture in our social fabric. Um, I think reflecting on what the Monon meant to Hoosiers and Midwesterners more broadly, um, it, it was just such a point of social connectivity. Um, and uh, that, that became a, a, you know, a really prominent theme in our work. Uh, part of the inspiration for the exhibit was engaging with public audiences that the Environmental Resilience Institute, uh, which again is really focused on um, adapting to and mitigating climate change might not have had the opportunity to reach. And so I had the great opportunity to partner with different cultural and history oriented organizations that you can see here. Um, and also the loans for the exhibit came from, uh, you know, a wonderful diversity of um, archives, um, including the IU Herbarium, the Paleontology Collection, um, it goes on and on, and many private collectors um, who are just so wonderfully knowledgeable about the railroad. Um, so 
here's another uh, evolution of the Monon emblem. So I think part of the story that we wanted to tell was, um, you know, what communities, what populations were left out of uh, the development and the social progress that came from the Monon. Um, so we can think about the dispossession of indigenous communities. We, we talk about that in the exhibition and how the marketing of the Monon in the 1940s and 50s um, drew this arc from indigenous imagery to the contemporary business of the railroad in an effort to convey the sense of authentic connection with the land. But when we go back and look at the history of Indiana, you know, there's a violent dispossession of indigenous peoples. Um, so that's something that artist Maria Whiteman goes into who, in her photography, and I, Richard's going to talk about that a little bit, but just to flag that for you. Another important story of resistance and the inequities of transportation and mobility is the Underground Railroad. Um, and it's important to note that there's often a misconception that the Underground Railroad was an actual railroad, and it was not. Uh, but in the case of the Monon, escaped slaves who crossed the Ohio River used the tracks of the Monon to make their way north to Salem. And the first president of the Monon, uh, James Brooks, was a Republican who is believed to have offered freedom seekers passes to ride the rails in their efforts to travel further north. Um, yeah, so part of my research was going um, into it, um, African American newspapers and looking at um, uh, the Black Pullman porters, their experiences working the line. Um, and there's just some very vivid imagery and stories from this that I think are really important to include in our imagination of what the Monon meant to Hoosiers. Um, and given the time, I'm going to turn it over to Richard now. I'm going to come back to this map uh, before we get to the Q&A. But Richard, I'll, I'll stop my screen share and hand it over to you. OK, thanks. I'm going to try to click on the right thing here. I believe this is it. Um, can you see my uh, presentation there? Yes, can you make it full screen? Let's see, it's a thumbnail. Oh, um, make it full screen. Um, if you, the in the uh, bottom left corner, you see, yep, that exactly. Is that it? That looks great. All right. Um, uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lizzie, for for that uh, for that presentation, and um, uh, thanks to everybody for for joining uh, today. A um, couple of quick notes: I'll be I'll be mentioning place names today without stating the name of the state. Uh, this is due to the fact that the Monon existed solely within the state of Indiana. Um, it accessed accessed both Louisville and Chicago via trackage rights. Um, this railroad enjoys an oversized fandom. Uh, it's one of those small regional roads that people love dearly, and not just rail fans, uh, but civilians, normal folk um, as well, particularly Hoosiers. Um, I'll just uh, give a little bit of a prologue here. Uh, my birthplace, Bloomington Hospital on South Rogers Street, uh, was within sight of the Monon. Um, by the time I was photographing railroads, however, the Hoosier line had been subsumed into the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. I joined a railroad club uh, that helped nurture my interest in railroads and skill in rail railroad photography. And I also had the good fortune of meeting Gary Dozel through this group. Some of you may know that he, along with his brother Stephen, would go on to write uh, a book called Moan on the Hoosier Line. I have to say here that Gary was... Uh, Gary graciously shared many of his favorite photographic locales with me. In any case, uh, the following images are, uh, I, I sort of have two parts to this exhibition, uh, a small part I called my vintage uh, uh, collection, and then, and then some contemporary photographs. So um, the, the following images here in this first part are a small part of the contribution, my contribution to the exhibit. Uh, made between 1975 and 1980. While those 15 slides are up, I'll relay a bit of the history of the line uh, and the place names are listed at the bottom of each slide. Um, while this image of a northbound manifest at Bedford looks like ancient history with train orders being physically hooked up, it was made 130 years after the railroad was chartered. 
as railroad goes, uh, railroads go in the United States go, the Monon is a fairly old one constructed well prior to the Civil War. More evident on its southern end, this railroad exhibits an organic nature built close to the ground with the right of way curving back and forth with the landscape rather than bolding, boldly cutting its way through it. Some of this character may show up in my vintage images with many being made between Bloomington and Bedford and not terribly long after the beloved Hoosier line was folded into the LMN in 1971. Um, I, I, I may repeat a little bit that, uh, that Lizzie covered here, but um, just, a, just a bit of history. Uh, the line began as the New, New, New Albany and Salem Railroad at the southern edge of the state. James Brooks, founder and first president of the railroad, looked north and saw Michigan City as a northern terminus, its raison d'etre to connect the Ohio River and Lake Michigan. On the way northward, the line went through Bloomington, which was home of Indiana University. Construction would continue north through another important university town, Lafayette, on its way to the Inland Sea. For a time, during the glamorous Barriger years in the following century, passenger equipment took on the colors of Indiana University, while freight locomotives wore the black and gold of Purdue University. For the life of me, I can't remember any of that. But for a time, uh, I was able to shoot Amtrak's Floridian. While having never photographed mass uh, Monon passenger trains, then um, uh, I will say I do recall my grandmother arriving on one when I was a young child. We would have collected her at the depot located at this very spot, a wonderful passenger station once stood where the drive-in bank does now in this image. Um, as uh, a little more history, as things developed in the latter half of the 19th century, the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago, as it was known by then, consolidated with the Indianapolis and Chicago Airline, previously the Indianapolis, Delphi, and Chicago. This new route uh, crossed the original one at Monon, uh, which was a town formerly known as Bradford. This superimposed a large X over the state and gave the road its unofficial moniker, the Monon Route. By the close of the 19th century, the road was reorganized as the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railway, though it continued to be referred to as the Monon. It wasn't until 1956 that the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville officially became the Monon, with reporting marks going from CIL to MON. Um, after 1971, these are the kinds of scenes one would have witnessed along the Mona. Gray l &M, uh, locomotives running between and alongside aging semaphores. Uh, but one could also see this passenger train, and that's always a good thing. The Floridian uh, moved, uh, I think it was on Penn Central uh, trackage, but it was moved to the former Monon in 75 or 76, but it would be discontinued in 1979. This is the train street running in Bedford. If that last scene, uh, if that last image seems familiar, you may have seen it in uh, Railroad Heritage, Heritage in 2017. Uh, some of my earlier work uh, on the Monon and the Illinois Central appeared in, this, uh, appeared in this article, which addressed the role of mentorship in railroad photography. I should say that the concept for the article was nurtured by Scott Lotus of the center. Again, not the cream and crimson of Monon passenger trains, but I did try to take advantage of what was placed before my eyes in the late 1970s. Right after school, I would, along with a buddy or two, jump in our big secondhand cars and go chase this passenger train through the hills of Indiana. At this point, the train was scheduled to run in both directions through Bloomington during daylight hours, no less, uh, often meeting between uh, Bloomington and Bedford. For a time, the train ran with E units uh, after SDP 40Fs were sidelined and before the F 40PHs could um, uh, become widespread and take over the duties there. So that was really, that was really special. And I even, I even knew it was special at that time. 
Um, in addition to the Monon, Bedford hosted the Milwaukee Road. This is getting a little off, off uh, topic perhaps, but uh, uh, the Milwaukee Road was in uh, Bedford. Um, and this was a, a real counterintuitive offshoot uh, of the Milwaukee called the Southeastern. Uh, here, a southbound l and train approaching Bedford uh, is seen ducking under a Milwaukee spur, winding its way off to the quarries on the northwest side of town. Uh, this was taken at a small place called Peerless, uh, Peerless, Indiana, again, between Bloomington and Bedford. I'm certain I plagiarized Mr. Dozel for this location and angle. One thing I certainly regret is not pursuing diesels into the surrounding quarries uh, more than I did. I believe this may be the only occasion I, I got a decent shot uh, of, a, of a locomotive working the quarries in the area. And it was, it was so important to the, uh, to, to the surrounding area that, that, that that's just really a shortcoming on my part. Uh, some of you may know that the limestone in this area is some of the best in the world and was very important to the local economy as well as the railroad. Uh, this is one of my favorites from the vintage series, uh, Northbound Antrex Floridian, uh, along with the Monroe County Courthouse in the background. That's in, that's in Bloomington. Uh, one vintage shot not in the exhibition. This is where, the, where Monon's Michigan City branch intersected with that of the newly abandoned Erie Lackawanna. Uh, this was in the wake of Conrail's creation in, in 1976. This is in December of 76. Uh, this may be the only photograph I took of the northern branch of the Monon. Which brings us to uh, the, the exhibit. Um, last summer, uh, as you heard, I was invited to join this project by Betsy Sturat, uh, one of the collaborators uh, whom I had met in graduate school at Indiana. Uh, the three artist photographers um, parceled up the main line between Louisville and Michigan City with me taking the northern section uh, from Michigan City down to Monon. One may note that within the northern half of this section, the Monon crossed 15 different railroads, most, most of them streaming toward Chicago. Um, currently only 25% of my portion is still active, the, the southern bit uh, between Monon and Madariville. Um, I took three shooting trips along the line in the fall of 2020, following the abandoned road that not unlike my uh, long-term project, contemporary views along the first transcontinental railroad. Uh, the bulk of my contribution then to this exhibit uh, is a series of contemporary landscape photographs made between Michigan City and that crossing of the, uh, in the railroad's namesake town, uh, Monon, looking for bits of history along the way. Uh, we saw this before in that, in that wonderful drone footage. Um, this is the Nipsco plant in Michigan City. Uh, 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 this, of course, Michigan City was the site of Monon's original northern terminus. Uh, it's interesting to note a huge sand dune once stood at the site of this, at the very site of this uh, power plant. It would be completely removed by rail and ship to make glass. Another interesting site in Michigan City uh, uh, was, uh, is, is now a, a strip mall. Uh, and, and this was the massive Pullman plant uh, once stood in this very spot. It's nestled alongside of, uh, alongside just east of the tracks of the Monon and the, and the Michigan Central. Uh, this was taken um, along the Chicago South Shore and South Bend, right where it crossed. The crossing is, is just uh, out of frame camera right, uh, sort of in the foreground. Um, but this is where the Chicago South Shore and South Bend crossed uh, both the Monon and the Michigan Central. Uh, interesting little S-curve here on the, on the South Shore uh, where it jogs from 10th Street to 11th Street uh, there in Michigan City. And I have to throw in one more vintage shot. Uh, this, is, this isn't along the Monon per se, but uh, um, uh, this is a, a shot taken in the, in the late 70s uh, at that very same spot. 
Um, but soon enough, we sort of uh, uh, leave Michigan City and uh, the railroad is abandoned for most of, you know, this Michigan City branch is abandoned for most of it. Uh, the l &N abandoned 75% of this branch. I have down April of 1981. I saw that somebody in the chat said 1980. So not positive about that, but, uh, but uh, that's, what, that's what my notes say anyways, April of 1981. Uh, this locale is just south of where the Pear Marquette crossed the Mon on, on Michigan City's uh, southwest side. Uh, moving, moving southward now along the branch, uh, this, we're in Westville now at a spot where the Wabash flew over the moon, uh, Monon. Here's an image made in Wanata. Um, there's, a, you can see there's a, stat, a static uh, display there of some, some artifacts, railroad artifacts and a crummy, um, uh, plus this plaque right in the middle uh, of the image uh, relates that uh, Lincoln's funeral train stopped here. Um, on the morning of May 1st, 1865, Lincoln's funeral train traveling up the Monon made a brief stop here in Wanata. Um, also, there was a crossing right behind me, uh, 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 the, the, the Pennsylvania cross right there. Uh, the Monon is coming directly at us. Um, sometimes it's difficult to follow an abandoned line like this, being gone for so long now. There are several spots up north where, with the help of the farmer's plow, even the roadbed has been scraped away, completely smoothed over, and absorbed back into the earth. In these areas, the former route can only now be perceived by the air or satellite, a subtle discoloration when compared to the surrounding loam. On the other hand, sometimes one is rewarded with hard evidence such as this fine abandoned tower just north of La Crosse. This is where the CNO crossed, by the way. Um, more typically, this is the case. With very little evidence, it's, diff it's difficult to imagine that three railroads once crossed here, the Monon, the Erie, and the Chicago, Attica, and Southern. Uh, that latter railroad was gone. It, uh, it, it didn't last long, and it was gone by the time of this wonderful Barriger photograph. Some of you probably know the, the fine Barriger collection in St. Louis, uh, where you can tour all around the Monon, uh, and you can ask permission to use these images. I chose two of these images uh, to do time comparisons in the exhibit, uh, one of them uh, done here uh, in Wilders. Uh, that's the Erie Crossing. Uh, we're looking directly north uh, along the Monon, and that's the Erie Crossing. This is just south of Wilders. Uh, we're looking south once again, and we, uh, the, the former roadbed here is, a, is now a private driveway, and we're approaching the Kankakee River. Um, I benefited by taking three trips in the fall. Um, because foliage would uh, sort of subside and, 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 and drop back and, uh, um, over time. And it really revealed more of the abandoned roadbed. And on my earlier trips, I'm sure I missed this completely, but if you look in the background uh, across the image, you can see the roadbed uh, crossing this little stream here and uh, off to, the, off to the, the, the background toward the left as well. Uh, this is just south of San Pierre. Um, oh, here I am uh, standing atop the towering grain elevator of the North Central Co-op in Madariville, uh, looking south. Um, this business is why uh, I will now be following rails still spiked to ties between this spot uh, down to Monon. CSX uh, runs up to Madariville and uh, collects cars here. Um, they have a little, uh, a little motorized thing they sort of kick cars around with here. So there's no switcher, unfortunately. Um, but uh, but CSS, uh, CSX runs trains up occasionally and picks up cars. Uh, this is a static display just south of Francisville. Uh, an astute scholar of the Monon, James Craig, tells me this was never a Monon car, alas. 
Um, somebody who made their um, I I'm sorry I should I should know their name uh, I didn't I didn't work directly with this man but uh, um, um, he's involved with the aggregate uh, or he was involved with the aggregate uh, quarry there uh, and he's invested a lot of money he I I, I believe he's the one behind uh, the Monon Museum just a little bit down the road here. And I have uh, three more images from just north of Monon. Uh, I'll go through kind of quickly. Um, the Monon pride I talked about uh, before is evidenced by the condition of this old crummy on, uh, on private property. This is just, just east of the tracks. Uh, you can see at East 1100 N. Um, right near there, this is at the same uh, crossing. You can see the, uh, the CSX tracks are in pretty good condition. Uh, reaching northward there. There's also some, some uh, not only the grain elevator up there, but there's, uh, there's some things in Francisville. Also, there's a popcorn uh, a company I tried to get into there. I wanted to, I wanted to photograph the popcorn in huge quantities, uh, but I never heard back from them. And it took me a couple of tries to get to the top of that grain elevator, um, but, but that, was, that was fun doing that. And then, and then here's a picture. Uh, you know, with this project, we wanted to look at the surrounding areas and the areas through which the railroad went, uh, um, or look for uh, connections to uh, the limestone industry, as I showed before, and the, and the agricultural in, uh, um, industry up north. So I had to shoot this combine uh, on my last trip down. Uh, we're finally into Monon itself. As, as in many small rural towns, blight is readily evident uh, in Monon's namesake burg. I'm always drawn to uh, post offices as well. I, I, I love the architecture of those. Uh, and you can see this one's made out of lime, probably Indiana limestone. And I'll end off with uh, the, the, the crossing that is the center of the X. Uh, on the state of Indiana. Um, while I grew up in the hilly south, it was a pleasure to get to know this other Monon, the one at the top end of the state, officially listed as the Northern Division, third subdivision. I hope what little of it is still evident speaks to the importance of what was once the Hoosier line. Um, here's my other time comparison, borrowing from the Barriger collection. Uh, of the same of the same place, so let's go back and forth. I didn't I didn't stand in exactly the same place, but uh, you can see what uh, uh, thing many things have changed here. Of course, the depot changed too after there was a, uh, a derailment. Uh, a, a train tried to go around that that Y track too quickly one night uh, and totally demolished this fine station you see here, and uh, a small brick one was put up in its stead. Um, let's see. So, uh, oh, one last thing I wanted to show just quickly were some installation views of the, uh, of the, uh, of the show, if I could, uh, very quickly. Um, this is the entryway when you walked in. This was the exhibit in, uh, at Indiana University. Uh, there are many artifacts in this opening uh, area. The drone footage is running with sound, so that uh, provided some nice ambient sound to, uh, to the exhibit. Um, and then if you go off to the left, uh, there's a larger gallery there uh, behind me, uh, which you can't see, are a lot of railroad artifacts and historical uh, things. Um, and, then, and then the three artist photographers were in this room. This is my work in the center. Toward the right is uh, Betsy Sturat, which I have a close-up of. Uh, here's another shot uh, of sort of my work off to the left. And you can see Maria Whiteman's work. Um, off to the right, uh, but there's also uh, uh, some, some objects, uh, um, historical objects and things uh, were in the gallery as well. This is, this is Betsy Sturat's work. She also worked uh, with photography primarily, but she also worked in um, connecting historical photographs with her contemporary photographs. In some, uh, such as this one, she actually uh, stuck the historical photographs right on top of her, um, her contemporary photograph. I'm gonna go back here, but if you look at the photographs in that grid on the wall to the right, uh, she kept those historical photographs separate. 
And then uh, there's two historical photographs and then a contemporary photograph of, a, of, of the same location. Those may all be of the bridge being built over um, the Ohio River at New Albany. Uh, yeah, that's her work. And then uh, Maria Whiteman's work, uh, a lot of photography uh, is in her work, but uh, she really works in, in, in multimedia. She's a real uh, multimedia artist, including handmade objects, video, uh, and photography. You can see that we used her photograph for our, post, uh, for our uh, poster. Um, and I think I just have a couple other examples of her work. There's another, there's another image of the blades on flat cars uh, that are so striking, you know, when you're talking about infrastructure and the span of time, uh, it's just uh, really wonderful to see that, that railroads can uh, chip in in, uh, in, in, in uh, renewables, uh, as you can see with these, with these blades on the cars. Some of her work, uh, another piece, another series of work she did is, is off to the right here where she was looking at uh, the natural resources that the railroad um, sort of accessed. Um, I was gonna mention that video, she made a video of the, about the Underground Railroad that was really quite stunning. But I am going to kick it back now to uh, Elizabeth uh, Grennan Browning. Uh, Lizzie, um, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thanks again, everyone for listening. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, and I'm looking at the time and perhaps I'm gonna hand it to Haley in case we have any time for questions. Um, but I really enjoyed Richard's presentation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, thank you to both of you. It was great to have this, you know, great partnership between you two with Richard with his, you know, fantastic knowledge of railroad history and Elizabeth with her social and environmental history. Um, you gave a very comprehensive and very um, interesting look at the Monon Railroad that I think a lot of our members probably haven't heard from before, you know, heard that uh, side of the story. So thank you very much. Yeah, Richard and Elizabeth, thank you both for, for sharing with us tonight. And, and one of the things I love about the center is that we're able to bring in such diverse perspectives and, and you know, from such a wide range of, of backgrounds and political persuasions and all of that. And the railroad gives us this common ground that we can have these conversations together. And I think that's just so important uh, all the time and especially in the times we're in right now. Um, Richard, one question that I had for you, um, you know, because you photographed the Monon some in your younger days uh, and such, you know, in the 1970s and so much has changed since then, what, what are some of the things that struck you the most, um, you know, in terms of, of what the railroad looked like in the 1970s versus uh, your more recent work? Oh, um, well, I, I just because of the way we, we parceled up the line, I was working on the North End and, and uh, the the North End is mostly gone, as you saw. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, it was it was much more reminiscent of of, of working uh, along the abandoned areas of the Transcontinental Railroad out west mm -hmm. uh, more so than than what I remember the Monon uh, growing up. Um, I do want to get down south. I think I think there's a fair amount of tracks still in place, mm -hmm. and maybe some rusting semaphores in place. So I would like to get down there to photograph, but I. I just haven't had a chance, but uh, but yeah, there was there was not a lot there was not a lot to see up there. I had to work hard to find those little bits of history as as I tried to show. And Elizabeth, a question I had for you is especially seeing the installation photographs, which I'm really glad you you included some of those at the end, Richard. Um, it, just in terms of tying so many different media together into this exhibit for so many different audiences, what were you looking for, and what do you think that that, I don't know, maybe, maybe your student viewers or other patrons of your university art museums, what do you think are their chief takeaways? What do you think they're looking for in, in this exhibit? That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, as the audience here today, you know, has shown that there's different expectations about what the railroad has meant and means. Um, and I think there's a tremendous amount of memory around the railroad. And as a historian, um, I specialize in environmental history, which is a relatively new subfield, but I'm interested in, um, you know, cultural history, social history, and history of memory. So I see the railroad as this really special uh, medium, this special, um, 
way to kind of engage with audiences um, and thinking about public history because people really have, you know, visceral memories and family stories around the railroad. So I think it's an interesting entry point to talk about environmental history in particular. So um, it's kind of surprising when you go in the exhibit and you do see a lot of environmental history because people aren't necessarily expecting that. But um, I think when we talk about how the Monon shaped uh, the development of industry in Indiana and the region um, and the transformation of natural resources. Um, you know, it's just a, a real natural um, medium for thinking about those transformations. Um, so I was really trying to convey um, how people's relationship with the environment has changed over time through their relationship with the railroad. And Elizabeth, it looks like um, we have some people who are interested in maybe some more long form um, texts on your work in particular for this project. Um, is there anything or any um, sources that people can go to to learn more about your research? That is a great uh, question. I, I have a personal web page, elizabethgrandenbrowning.org. Um, I can drop that in the chat. Um, but I, it's something I... I would like my works, I, I would like to write some more journal articles or perhaps an anthology about the railroad in the Midwest and in Indiana. Um, so this exhibit, especially collaborating with artists was just such a wonderful experience. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of seeing how, where, where our ideas go um, as we're moving forward here with the new Albany exhibit. Um, so stay tuned, I'll have hopefully more to report on that. Let's see, we have a few more coming in on the, in the Q&A. Um, so uh, Paul Hensler asked for as much renown that South Bed has with Notre Dame, it seems like the railroads ignored this town. Is this the case or is that just a misrepresentation on his part, <laughs> I guess? See, sorry, is this in the chat? Hold on, sorry. I'm... Oh, it's in the it's in the Q and A. Oh, the Q and A, yeah. Q and A, okay. Also, I mean, South Bend is the is the terminus of the of the South Shore interurban line, so there mm -hmm. is still passenger service, and and I believe uh, does an Amtrak stop in South Bend as well, or they have a station nearby that serves South Bend, I think. Yes. Um, oh gosh. I'm I'm sure they... I've ridden through there in the middle of the night so many times. <laughs> Oh, no. Good question, but I, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> so Tom Burke wrote in, um, North Shore, Canadian National, and South Shore all serve South Bend today. Yeah, and uh, Elkhart is where Amtrak runs, as Ryan Kringle notes. Thank you. <laughs> Showing my, my uh, lack of Indiana Railroad knowledge <laughs> today. <laughs> But that's the wonderful thing about our community. There's uh, there's always someone who knows more about mm -hmm. any piece of track in the world than I do. And if I just find them, I can learn more myself, which is fantastic. That's for sure. Um, Elizabeth, why don't you tell us a little bit more about some of the other photographers in addition to, to Richard, whose work was, was represented in the exhibition? Sure. Um, and I'm glad Richard included some of their um, images. And if, if you want to see uh, more I, in the chat box, I had put uh, the virtual exhibit um, at the Bloomington IU Grunewald Gallery. Um, but Maria Whiteman, um, she's the um, Artistic and Social Practice Fellow at the Environmental Resilience Institute. So she's my colleague here. Um, and she just does tremendous work. Um, she has been working a lot with uh, mushrooms in the area of Bloomington um, and uh, photographing them and studying them with biologists here at IU Bloomington and kind of the stories they can tell us about um, resilience. Uh, so she's she's a really fascinating character um, and as Richard mentioned, multimedia um, artist. And then Betsy um, Sturrett, she, uh, her work I really appreciate it as a historian because um, she ties together her contemporary photographs with um, historic footage, uh, a lot of which had, you know, a railroad accident, and, you know, just things that were documented at the time. So it was fascinating to see the stories that she came across in the archives. Um, and it really, you know, I, I gained a lot of expertise and knowledge from her um, just through 
her researching, you know, photography and the methodology of um, photography in the, in the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, so both really different perspectives. I think all three artists have such a unique contribution um, and together, you know, it's just remarkable um, the different stories that they, they tell about the railroad. A question for both of you, um, is, there, is there something that you wanted to have in the exhibition that you couldn't? And, and if mm -hmm. so, what? Oh, that's a great question. Of course, I, this was, um, I, I learned a lot about putting together an interdisciplinary exhibition. I think um, it's hard to distill four different viewpoints into one, into one small space, you know? So right. I think there's, I think I, I would have loved to do more oral histories. Um, and um, we do have a fair amount of loans from personal collections, but I think loans related to the various industries that the railroad was tied to, um, that would have been a special um, uh, addition to the exhibition from my perspective. I don't know if Richard has another idea. I'm curious to hear. I was, I was, I, for, for me, it was successful. I, I, I insisted that we have a semaphore in there and we were able to track one down. At first we had a Milwaukee uh, semaphore, but we kept digging and eventually we came up with a, uh, luckily one dropped in our lap actually, uh, <laughs> a semaphore blade um, in really great condition. So we, we, we mounted that on the wall in there. So I was, I was quite happy with that. Yeah, no, the, the Monon was certainly well known in our in our rail enthusiast community as being one of the last stands of the, the Civil Force signals. And I, I myself made one trip to see them uh, in, I think, 2007. And I remember I was I was showing a couple of my pictures of us uh, to my wife's uh, stepmother, who, you know, has no more interest in trains than, than the average person would. And she was very taken by them and distinctly recalled the metal semaphore signals of her brother's Lionel train set and, and just the, the, again, that sort of tactile memory that she had of, of those heavy metal semaphores from his Lionel and being able to see them. So, so yeah, you're right. I mean, that's, a, that's an important cultural touchstone and, and something that's certainly been a, a railroad icon, um, you know, the, that, that extended beyond just the railroad community's interest. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, a tag team question for, for Elizabeth and Richard. Um, so I'm curious about the environmental and cultural impact of the Monon specifically as compared to maybe some of the other contemporary railroads. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I mean, what comes to mind is the limestone industry, you know, um, the railroad, Mo the Monon made possible, you know, Indiana's limestone industry. I think being here in Bloomington, but I'm very <laughs> aware of that. Um, but also when you think about um, Indiana at the time of Euro-American settlement uh, around 1800, it was 90% forested. Um, and people will kind of forget that, you know, when you're traversing um, Indiana's landscape today, there's, it's just all soy and corn. Um, and so thinking about, you know, the lumber industry and furniture manufacturing and um, in New Albany, where there's the Gunnison Magic Homes, um, you know, the prefabricated housing. So seeing how all parts of not just our social cultural lives, but, you know, domestic lives and homemaking were affected um, and kind of the built environment of our cities. There's so much that came from Indiana that the railroad can really get to the heart of. Um, but I think these stories, uh, you know, it's, we talked about the Monon as a microcosm. These stories, you know, are, are nationwide, and I think historians and artists um, would do well to to look in their own backyards at what, what railroad stories they can find. Um, I can't think of any way that it was probably different than than others. I mean, the 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 limestone industry was was very specific, but but any other railroad would have tapped into whatever uh, whatever area they went through as well. So um, I don't know how it would be different than uh, than other railroads. Would you say, uh, and, and I'm just I'm just kind of spitballing here, but would you say that because the Monon was so focused ex almost exclusively on Indiana that it may have 
events perhaps a higher than average level of local pride than citizens in their in their railroad and do you find those traces still exist today oh yes yes <laughs> i um you know I, I i will defer to richard again on this because he's studied railroads more extensively across the nation but um there is so much pride about the monon um and uh, you know, it really was, it prided itself as a passenger line for, mm. for a long time. I think the last passenger train was in the 1960s, um, but it, you know, it went to all the major colleges, um, you know, so people had, it connected not just industry, but um, communities in a, in a major way. Um, but uh, Richard, do you have any insights on how the Monon pride compares to other regions? Oh, that's a good question. Um, other than to sort of underscore what you said, I mean, uh, I moved away, so 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 you're still you're st you know you live there where the Monon uh, was, and I moved away. But uh, I do belong to a Facebook group that uh, that a couple that that follow the Monon, and you can certainly you can certainly feel that pride there. But but yeah, I, I it's funny. I think I think back in the back in the day that uh, normal normal people would 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 feel connected to the railroad. I think uh, that you don't, you don't really experience that anymore, you know, in this day and age, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, there's a, people have a soft place in their heart for the Mona, for sure. One of our board members, Al Lauer. Hi, Al. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, mentions that the, the Monon served the resort at French Lick, uh, which was a popular destination for its casino, and that uh, Al Capone was a regular visitor there at one time. Wow. Did you come across any of that history and in, in putting in, in gathering materials for this? Yes, absolutely. French Lick. Um, yeah, I was reading how tourists from Chicago, you know, would take the Monon down to French Lick and then um, also go on to the Kentucky Derby. You know, there, it was um, uh, definitely the elite uh, looked to vacation um, in those areas. So uh, the Monon, um, yeah brought people to the places they wanted to go in Indiana, for sure. And one of their trains was called the Thoroughbred for that reason. Yeah. Great. Clever. I think we have some pictures of a Thoroughbred in at least one of our collections in, in Chicago, but you know, heading to, coming from or heading to Indiana. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, well, I think we've gone through most of the, the questions that have been sent in. Oh yeah, and Steve Patterson mentions John John Berger's uh, tenure at the Monon and his work on on keeping its passenger trains running. Uh, good good point to to mm -hmm. to mention Steve and certainly uh, Richard. It's nice to see some of Berger's photographs in the in the exhibit to, in the in your presentation and, and I'm sure in the exhibit too. I remember getting the chance to see those at the library in St. Louis and it really is a trove of of railroad imagery from from you know a, a very unique perspective at a unique time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's true also that Berger really tried to breathe life back into the, you know, railroad passenger. He really made it glamorous uh, with, with uh, the way he, you know, the equipment he bought and, and painted those locomotives. It really was, it really was a sort of last gasp effort, uh, but eventually it, it uh, failed. Oh, and... Uh... Yeah, Tom Burke shared a, a link that maybe we can drop in the in the chat for everyone. I can go ahead and I think it's already shared with the attendees as well. Oh, it is with the attendees. Yeah, you're right. Very good. I just yeah. Thanks, Tom. That's great. That's and a good Al notes, Al notes that every night the Monon picked up a Pullman at the Broad Ripple Station in suburban Indianapolis, so passengers would not be required to go all the way to Union Station. Yeah, that's those uh, those Pullman connections were were nice nice services in the, in the days that they existed. Mm -hmm. That's right, somebody points out that, that he, he famously remanufactured those, those army hospital cars into, into passenger equipment. That's correct. Yes, Berger was nothing if not resourceful in his, uh, in his railroad leadership. Well, it looks like we've gotten through all the questions. 
And thanks everyone for chiming in with questions and, and all the comments. Again, it's always great to see the, the incredible depth of knowledge in our, in our community. And, and we're, we're so glad to share that. And, and Richard and Elizabeth, uh, thank you for sharing your, your work with us. And it's great to know that the exhibit's going to have another, another venue and we hope it can, can uh, carry on after that. And maybe we'll get to see it in person at some point too, if, uh, if all continues to go well. Yeah, search for venues in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> well, in the end, it's not that far from us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much, Scott and Healy. Really, this was a great pleasure and just enjoyed getting to learn more about the center and, and get to share the exhibit with you all. Thanks, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for bringing it to our attention and, and thanks for sharing it with us. Thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Thanks for your questions and comments. Again, we'll have this up on our YouTube page next week. Um, Haley put a link to that in the chat. We can share that again uh, before we head off. And Haley, I believe we are working on another presentation for July. Is that right? Yes, our next presentation is scheduled for July 13th. We're going to be doing a reprise, or not a reprise, an extension of Yoichi Iwazaki's, one of our presenters at our last virtual conversations. Um, he's going to do an extension on his photography between New York and Tokyo. Um, so look forward to that. Um, I posted a link in the chat um, for our events page on our website. We will post information, registration information there once we have that up. And I've also reposted the link for our YouTube page. Um, the recording for this event will be posted there early next week. And for everyone tuning in, we are tentatively hoping that we might be able to have an in-person event uh, of our own at some point uh, in uh, the late summer or early fall timeframe, probably early fall at this point. Uh, no details finalized yet, but we do hope to make an announcement uh, in the not too distant future as hopefully things come together for that. And, and we, uh, we sure hope, uh, look forward to seeing as many of you in person as we can later this year. So stay safe out there uh, and I hope you have some good summer travels and get out to, to see your local railroad scene and, and maybe thinking about it in some different ways after hearing from Richard and Elizabeth tonight. So thanks all again. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in July, if not before. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.